Welcome to Cyclone Insiders. Uh, in today's episode, we're going to go ahead and talk about some men's and women's basketball. Both of them have finished up their regular seasons and are going to be heading into Big 12 tourney action this week. So we're going to go ahead and talk about their games next and more on Cyclone Insiders. Welcome back to Cyclone Insiders. The Iowa State men's basketball team has had three games this past week, all of which are losses like the rest of the um, conference games this season. But what do you guys kind of think these last three games showed us about our team here? Um, I really think it showed that, I mean, they hung in there with Texas and they kind of hung in there with Kansas State. Uh, Texas Tech was just a good old-fashioned blowout where a manager got some minutes, which was kind of embarrassing to see. Cool for that guy, but not cool as an Iowa State fan. And uh, didn't have Razier Bolton in any of those games. Maybe he would have been in the difference against a team like K-State and helped pick up a conference win, but basically overall just still a team that can be so close but so far away. And it's, it's really come down to the last – five or so minutes of a lot of these games where Iowa State just doesn't execute and they kind of just tail off towards the end of the game, which has really been the story of a lot of the season. So I think it was pretty consistent with how the season has been so far. Uh, hopefully they can get on a hot streak in the tournament, maybe shock the world and uh, make the make the NCAA tournament. Who knows? Yeah, Aaron, I agree with you. I think, you know, it was important to see the younger guys play. You know, we weren't just going to pack the bags and call it a season, even though mostly everyone knows that it's not a good chance for us to let alone even win the Big 12 tournament. But uh, I, you know, it definitely would have helped having Rasier out there and maybe winning a close game like K-State. But all in all, I think it was good, uh, product, or, uh, good to see the younger guys out there like we talked about on this show every week, just kind of looking forward till next year. Yeah, I think uh, Bolton's absence was obviously evident in those three games. Um, I wish someone like Xavier Foster would have been able to get some minutes, you know, late this season so we could see what he's about and get him some experience. But um, I've liked what Jalen Coleman Lance has showed lately. Um, he's really stepped up the second half of the season, um, despite not having any wins to show for it. Yeah, I like what you said about Coleman Lands there. He's like the one bright spot. I mean, looking at these past three games, Tyler Harris and Trey Jackson couldn't hit the bronze side of a barn. Harris was like a combined five for 25 from beyond range. So that pretty much sums up all you need to know about this Iowa State team this season. But, um, you know, we're still fighting. Got another game tonight, actually, as we're recording this against Oklahoma. But um, do you guys think that playing, you know, that many games helped them going into the Big 12 tournament or not Not so much? Uh, it can only help them. I really don't know what could hurt this team considering how their season has gone uh, other than injuries. So, you know, hopefully those three games without Bolton just made them stronger as a team. And now that Bolton is back tonight coming off the bench, uh, hopefully those younger guys getting experience can help towards the future and maybe win a, at least a couple games in this Big 12 tournament. Who knows? Right. And I like what you said there about getting the experience, no matter who's going to be out there. And uh, I think overall, we're just at rock bottom right now. And uh, nothing really can make us a worse team besides its injuries, but uh, ultimately, I would say it probably helped us as a whole uh, going into the going into next season, and hopefully, we can see that kind of uh, production out of the younger guys next season. Yeah, my my answer was the exact same. I mean, um, can't really hurt you know, two wins on the season. Uh, get those young guys some experience for next season. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think you guys hit the nail on the head there. Um. Iowa State currently down eight at halftime, 36-28. Rasir Bolton with zero points off the bench. But, um, 
you know, what do you guys think this team can kind of do in this game or I guess in the second half to pick it up against this Oklahoma State, Oklahoma team? Uh, number one, just shoot the ball well. Their first matchup against Oklahoma this year, they managed to still shoot only 38%, even though they shot 52% from beyond the arc. And they're in, in their most recent matchup against Oklahoma before tonight, they shot 39% overall and 21% on threes. And uh, uh, also winning the turnover battle, because this is a team, as we've seen this season, that just can't afford to make a, make mistakes whatsoever. And turnovers are a part of that. And also getting to the free throw line. They've shot eight free throws combined in both of their games against Oklahoma, and Oklahoma has shot 43, which is a humongous disparity. And you can blame some of that on the – I guess you could try to blame some of that on the rest, but really I would say it has to put pressure on the officials, get into the paint, and force them to make the call and take advantage of those free points at the line. Yeah, and I think uh, if we look at the statistics, of the Oklahoma team as a whole, they're shooting 33% from three. So I think if in the second half we can kind of pressure them into shooting more threes and like you were saying, Aaron, win the turnover battle. Uh, also what uh, Iowa State can do themselves is to make the right shot selections. Honestly, so far they've uh, just been shooting it early into the shot clock or really just uh, getting a good shot, not shooting it at the right time and whatnot. But I think Austin Reeves uh, of Oklahoma is definitely their best player. So if we can double team him more, or just hold him to less points and cause more turnovers out of him, I think we'd definitely be able to sneak a win out of this. Yeah, I, uh, I'd like to see a consistent third score behind Corn Lands and Bolton. Um, obviously, Bolton put up zero in that first half, so I'm um, going to need him to get going in the second half or else I don't foresee I would stay having much of a chance. Um, Johnson put up good first half numbers other than outside shooting, so uh, that's a positive sign for the second half. <clears throat> yeah, in their last few matchups against Oklahoma, they kind of got dominated on the boards. I mean, it was 41 to 36 in the last matchup and 40 to 30 in the first one. So really just controlling the glass, is pretty much Iowa State's uh, only chance, in my opinion, because th that way they can just kind of control the tempo and uh, play their own game instead of getting what Oklahoma's got. But, um, you know, they did, on the bright side, play Oklahoma twice during the regular season. Only down eight at half. Do you guys think there is any chance for an upset? Yeah, I mean, we've seen over and over again with this team that there's a chance for an upset. Uh, whether or not they actually do it comes down to execution, and that's what's been lacking so far in uh, a lot of those close games. But, you know, maybe maybe they just need Hilton South to start winning some games. Uh, hopefully that's the case. Yeah, and I, I think we also have to keep in mind this is March and the Big 12 tournament where I think anything can really happen. You know, we got to defend that Big 12 title that we still have. But uh, honestly, I think there is still a chance for this upset. If we look back at their previous games against Oklahoma in the regular season, uh, one, one of them they lost by seven, the other lost by nine. So like you're saying, Aaron, it's uh, really about executing uh, in those clutch moments, which we have not really seen from this team so far, but you never know. It's March. Let's see some madness. Yeah, I, I'd like to think uh, there's a chance to announce that. Um, certainly a bigger chance than I think people give them credit for, um, a 2 and team. Um, I think the bench need to get a little bit more production off the bench. Um, Arthur Bolton come off the bench helps that aspect. Um, and that's for me to get him going in the second half. <clears throat> yeah, just getting rid of that stagnation a little bit on offense. I mean, I would say they're not necessarily known as a scoring team, but they're also not really known as a defensive team. So just like controlling uh, the tempo of the game is going to be really important for them in that second half if they want to get it done. But... As unlikely as it is that Iowa State does pull out the upset, who do you guys think will end up winning the Big 12 tournament? So, <clears throat> Baylor is obviously the easy pick, but I really think anyone seeds one through six has a good shot. And even Oklahoma as the seven seed has a good shot too. Uh, it's a very competitive conference this year, like it always is, but this year has just been crazy really for the conference as a whole. And it kind of sucks with the level of conferences on this year that Iowa State isn't in the mix. 
But uh, Baylor and Kansas should definitely be the favorites. But if I were if I were gonna pick an actual team other than them, I would say Cade Cunningham could take Oklahoma State uh, all the way. Right, and I think it's uh, no, it's very well notable to say that there are seven teams uh, from the Big Twelve Conference in the top twenty-five. So this is a very competitive conference. But if I was a betting man, I would have to either bet on Baylor, Kansas, or West Virginia. I think those are three of the best teams in the country. Uh, but I'm really excited to see where they can take this tournament. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, so obviously, uh, as Aaron mentioned, Baylor is the popular pick. Um, I'm going with Oklahoma State. Um, been hot lately. Um, beat Oklahoma twice. And then beat West Virginia without Cunningham. Um, get him back. Um, that's my kind of secret pick to win it. Yeah, as much as I want to dwell on the, you know, lower ranked teams, I think Baylor's just going to be too much to handle. I mean, they got some tremendous players, especially in, <coughs> excuse me, Butler and Mitchell there and even vital i mean he's one of the best defenders he gets uh, all up in your grill so uh, but it'll be interesting to see what happens um you know kind of going off that a little bit i know logan mentioned it that we have seven ranked teams where do you guys kind of think the big 12 conference ranks in terms of talent across the nation well the the likely future number one draft pick plays in the conference so that's a start and I honestly think this year the Big Ten and Big 12 are going to rival at the top in terms of talent and competition in their respective conferences. With the ACC, the current states of Duke and North Carolina not really being the powerhouses we're used to them being. And there's some SEC teams doing pretty good, but no can. So I think you can argue where each one is, either one or two, but no matter what, you've got to have the Big 12 and the Big 10, 1A and 1B uh, and for this season specifically. Right. I, I like what you were saying, Aaron, about the about Duke and North Carolina. I haven't really been the teams that we're used to seeing uh, in the NCAA, but I would definitely agree that it's uh, number one and two interchangeable between the Big 12 and the Big 10. Uh, all across the conference, they have great teams, and uh, I really enjoy watching teams like Baylor from the Big 12 and Iowa from the Big 10. But uh, I think both conferences are very fun to watch this season. Yeah, I agree. It's a neck-and-neck -neck race for who's number one between those two. Um, I think Big 10 has the uh, better top-in um, teams. Um, and then Big 12, obviously, I think better top-to-bottom with those seven top 25 teams. Yeah, um, as Spencer said, Big Ten, they got four right now in the top ten with Illinois, Michigan, Iowa, and Ohio State. Um, likely all going to get high seeds, you know, Big 12. Meanwhile, they're probably going to be in those four to five range. So in my personal opinion, I like what you guys said there, um, interchangeable. But I think Big 12 is actually going to do more damage uh, in this NCAA tournament because – um, a lot of the Big Ten teams, they rely on offense. And when it comes to the tournament, um, those offense teams, if they have one bad night, somebody can, you know, lower season can easily knock them off. So we'll see uh, how that goes. But that's what I think. Now we're talking about the NCAA tournament. Do you guys have any Power 5 sleeper teams that you think can make a run in their conference tournament and kind of shake up the picture a little bit? So going back to Duke in North Carolina, if they either one of those teams gets hot at the right time, they can shuffle things around for the ACC. And also any of those middle-of-the-pack ACC teams like Clemson, Georgia Tech, or Louisville. And uh, Florida State and Virginia are at the top of the conference, but it's still pretty tight in the ACC. And I think the same thing goes for a lot of those middle-of-the-pack SEC teams. But if I'm going to pick any dark horse team, it's Oklahoma State. Because we've seen in the past what happens when you have a Steph Curry or a Kemba Walker. And I think this March, Cade Cunningham is going to be one of those guys who's just so talented and so fun to watch that Oklahoma State is going to surprise some people. 
Yeah, and uh, the two that I have picked out, they're not uh, major sleepers, but I think uh, Minnesota in their respected conference tournament could be considered a sleeper. Uh, I really liked watching their center, Liam Robbins, who's from Iowa, and I believe he transferred from Drake. Uh, he's very entertaining to watch. They ha he has been injured, so I don't know what his status is about coming back in the Big Ten tournament. But uh, I, th I think they're a very fun team to watch. Other team is Creighton. You know, they've kind of been in the middle of the pack the whole season uh, in the top 25. But I think in their conference, they should uh, have a not a super easy way to the finals, but uh, they're going to make some noise in their tournament uh, most definitely. Yeah, so I also consider Minnesota. Um, they were top 25 earlier this year. I think they're below 500 now. Um, so I agree with that pick. Um, but actually, my two picks were actually teams that Aaron mentioned, um, North Carolina and Duke. Um, Duke in particular, hovering around 500. Um, I'm not outside looking in right now, but still a lot of talent if they can get things together um, and make a run in the ACC tourney. Um, North Carolina's in, um, but if they win a few games in the ACC tourney, certainly boost their stock for the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I'm actually going to go back to the Big Ten. I'm going Michigan State. Um, right now, they're kind of on the bubble, but they're the nine seed for the Big Ten tournament. And I feel like a lot of people have just kind of, you know, throwing them off the table and stuff. Um, you know, if they actually got ranked, they're currently at an 11 seed, kind of towards that first four in mark. Um, yeah, last four in, sorry. And... Um, but anyways, uh, if they got an 11 seed, that would be the lowest in their program's history. But anytime you're coached by Tom Izzo and you kind of got that uh, tough mindset, you're going to be hard to knock off for anybody, whether that's uh, when it comes to March with the conference tournament and instant league tournament. So I think they can make some noise, but we'll see. Now, switching over things over to the women's side of things, they're also going to their conference tournament um, heading into this weekend. They face Texas in the first round on Friday. Iowa State lost both matchups during the regular season. What do you guys kind of think they need to do differently on Friday to get a different uh, result in the first round? Um, so they need to slow down Charlie Collier. Uh, she's averaging 18 points and 16 and a half rebounds per game against Iowa State this season. And they have not shot well in both games against Texas this year. And they've lost the turnover battles both times. So those are two things they need to change around to come out on top. But I think, honestly, the biggest thing is if they can get Collier to have an off night, they're going to have a pretty good chance to win that game because a lot of their offense and defense goes through her. Right. And uh, overall, uh, Texas has shot uh, 44%. So I think definitely limiting them on uh, both uh, uh, beyond the arc and in the paint, you know, it's obviously going to, help us uh, win the game and be more efficient on defense. And also what you were saying, Aaron, uh, win the turnover battle. I believe last time we turned it over 15 times compared to their 13. So not a huge difference, but late in the games, those turnovers definitely matter. So I think uh, just playing an overall better defensive game and uh, making sure that we get those turnovers when we need them. Yeah, so they certainly need to take care of the ball, as you guys mentioned. Um, 17 and 15 turnovers in the two matchups against Texas this year. Um, my other key for that game um, is to get Lexi Donarski going. Um, just 10 points per game in those two matchups on a combined seven for 24 from the field. Um, obviously not comparable to her um, stats throughout other games the rest of the season. Um, so they need to get her going um, to give to complement Ashley Jones. Yeah, um, Charlie Collier, she, in one game against Iowa State, had 19 rebounds. I mean, that is just – they, they need to find some way to slow her down if they want to stand any chance because, um, you know, as we kind of talked about earlier in the show – or not in this show, but in past shows um, – Christian Scott, she's she's a post player, but she's not a post player like Collier is. She, you know, can knock it down from the outside and stuff. So, really just Iowa State needs to – Texas has got some shooters, but – you know, kind of find a way to run them off the line and keep the ball out of Kyler's hands at the same time uh, will result in the best success for them, I think. Um, but either way, Texas is a seven seed, and Iowa State is uh, slotted as an eight seed right now in the bracket, latest bracketology. So 
theoretically, a loss wouldn't really matter, but a win streak uh, definitely could help Iowa State team down the stretch. But um, as Spencer mentioned, uh, Alexi Donarski um, – really has came on lately. She was unanimously voted uh, the Big 12 Freshman of the Year, first Cyclone since 1998 to receive that honor. Uh, what do you guys think she's really brought to the table for this team this year, and uh, has she lived up to her five-star status? So I would say winning Freshman of the Year unanimously for your conference is a good way to live up to your five-star status, but she's been a huge impact player, averaging about 13 points per game, and she started out the season kind of shooting cold, but she's been shooting a lot better lately. She's had a game with seven threes, and I also think a game with five or six. Um, and hopefully she'll be a great player in the years to come. And I think getting this experience in the Big 12 tournament and then uh, in the NCAA tournament is going to be huge for her and the rest of the freshman class moving forward. Yeah, definitely. And it's uh, amazing to see that uh, unanimous vote uh, on her behalf and – Congratulating her, definitely. But uh, I think it's notable to look at her shooting numbers. Like overall, like you were saying, Aaron, started out kind of cold, but now overall uh, 40% and then 41% from deep. So I think she's definitely lived up to that five-star status. And I'm very excited to see what her and the rest of the freshman class can bring for the next couple seasons at Iowa State. Yeah, as you guys mentioned, I think she's definitely lived up to that five-star status thus far um, through her freshman year. Um, she's obviously added an element of elite three-point shooting to the team um, and brought a very good compliment to Ashley Jones. Um, and I think it's um, exciting just to see uh, the future with, of the team with her um, likely being the face of the program. Yeah, I think just as, you know, that's that's kind of all, all freshmen. They'll just come in a little less confident and as time goes on and you get more minutes uh, and you start to see those shots fall. It just makes it a lot easier for you. And, um, you know, she may not uh, be there yet defensively, but I think that's just going to come as, you know, you train more and uh, get, get that more seasoning under your belt. Um, we could see her kind of develop into a defensive force as well. But right now, she's definitely got the shooting. Um, you know, just needs to work on that decision-making and uh, defense a little bit, and she'll be uh, up there to be another one of those great Cyclones. I mean, at this point, she's already passed uh, Bridget Carlton and Ashley Jones in terms of freshman performance, so who knows. But we mentioned Jones. She was a first-team pick. Christian Scott got on the second team for the second year in a row. Jones also um, was on first team last year. And then another freshman, Emily Ryan, got on the all-freshman team. But – do you guys think that Ashley Jones got snubbed of the Player of the Year award? It was given to Melissa Smith from Baylor. Baylor, you know, best team in the conference. Do they, you know, deserve it just because they uh, had the best team? What do you guys kind of think on that topic? I mean, averaging 18 points and nine rebounds and shooting 54% for a team that's ranked sixth in the country, definitely very deserving. And Ashley Jones' stats are insane. She's averaging... 23 points and nine rebounds on 46 percent shooting and although i think ashley jones has been a more than deserving player this season i don't really have a problem with smith winning player of the year just if you look at the way she impacts the game every baylor game and uh where they're ranked this season and how successful that program has been uh, i think it's a fair pick for a big 12 player of the year yeah, and uh, I think you can look at really any league, and if you see the uh, the best team overall and what that the best player is on that team, most likely is going to win that award. Uh, I think it's notable that you said she was shooting 54%. Now, it just really matters what stats you look at. You know, if you look at the shooting percentage, but then you look at the point per game, yeah, I think there's a case for both sides, but like you were saying, saying Aaron I think she definitely deserved it overall although there is a strong case for Ashley Jones yeah I personally think um Ashley Jones should have won that just because um I think it's you have a hard time convincing me that there's a player in the country that's more valuable to your team than Ashley Jones um with that being said I wouldn't exactly call it a snub just because as you guys mentioned Melissa Smith put up good numbers for Baylor um and is obviously on the best player on the best team. Yeah, I, I, I had a lot of trouble with this, but 
I think I agree with Spencer that, um, you know, she should have won it because Ashley Jones for this team, especially with those freshman uh, guards, he has to develop a sense of bringing the ball down the court, being our best rebounder, and still putting up 24 points a game. Like, there's nobody else in the country that does what she does on a night-in, night-out basis. And, um, you know, she she only shoots 32% from behind the arc, but that's still really good for a forward. So, um Ashley, you know, she's she's done a great job. Um, definitely going to go up there as one of Iowa State's greats. But on the positive side, she's going to have another year to go after it. So hopefully next year she can get it done. But either way, um, Iowa State, like we said, is going to be in action on Friday. So uh, go ahead and stay tuned with them and see if they can uh, move through their tournament before Selection Sunday. But that's going to be it for Cyclone Sports. When we come back, we're going to talk about – just some random professional sports teams, you know, going to talk about some good players and some not so good. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Cyclone Insiders. Now we're going to shift over to the pro side of things. We're just going to talk about some, you know, some random questions. But I can tell you this, they're good ones and you're going to be interested to see who we pick. So our first one here. If you were going to start a franchise in any major professional sport, uh, football, baseball, basketball, the major three, what athlete would you guys pick to start your franchise with? So I'm going to be the baseball guy. Very easy pick for me and Mike Trout. Uh, when it's all said and done, he's going to be one of the greatest Major League Baseball players ever. And uh, the amount of success he's already had at the age of 28, might be 29, hasn't even hit 30 yet. Uh, one rookie of the year, he has three MVPs, eight silver sluggers, over 300 home runs, and uh, getting closer to 1,000 RBIs. And baseball is one of those sports that you can't really attribute success to an individual. I don't really want to knock him for – how the Angels have played in his career. I think if he were on a different team, uh, he very likely could have a, a World Series and a World Series MVP, uh, which if the Angels don't start getting better, hopefully he does go to another team. He's one of those players, honestly, like Matt Stafford, that I would just be happy for them to get away. But uh, yeah, Mike Trout for the MLB, very easy pick for me. So I got the NBA, and I really was going for – uh, a young player that if the fran if I had to start a franchise right now, I'm building around this guy. Now it's a tough tie between these two players, but these are some of the best shooters in the NBA at such a young age. I've got Trey Young and Luka Doncic. I think they're some of the best, two of the best shooters in the league. Luka has all we've obviously seen some production with him on the Mavs. You know, him and Porzingis. Porzingis has been hurt for a while, but he's back this season. I think you could sway me in believing that they're going to make the playoffs, but I think possibly not. Uh, Trey Young on the Hawks, I feel bad for him. You know, he's obviously got John Collins. He had an aging Vince Carter. Uh, not a lot of pieces to build around there, but it doesn't matter. Trey Young dropped close to 30 points every night and shoots lights out. Luca is one of the best players in the NBA right now. Top five. I could bait that all day. So Trey Young and Luka Doncic. Uh, real quick before I answer, um, no love for Giannis? Nope. <laughs> the Greek freak on your team? Freak for a reason. Oh, that's, that's bad. That's bad. <laughs> um, my answer is pretty easy. Uh, Patrick Mahomes. Um, best quarterback in the league. Um, has one Super Bowl, two Super Bowls. I'm, I'm, I'm. Two I'm appearances. One, two appearances. One Super Bowl. I'm blanking. Um, one Super Bowl, but uh, I think barring a major injury, I think he's probably going to be in the top ten quarterback minimum, um, pretty easily of all time. Um, I also see the Chiefs as being the next Patriots. Um, just in the fact of contending with Super Bowl year in, year out. Um, yeah, pretty simple. Catch your moms. Baker Mayfield? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You're a okay. sooner admit it. Trey Young and then Baker Mayfield. <laughs> Here's the surprise, guys. I'm not picking anybody, but I'm going to critique everybody's selections here. All right. Aaron, we got to talk here. 
<laughs> Mike Trout. Uh, how? Yeah. Thank you, Logan. Okay, so Trout is what? Is he over 30, 31, 30? No, he's like 29, 28. Okay, okay big difference. Okay. So he's right in the prime of his career. Okay. You're starting a franchise, right? You're not going to be good for like four or five seasons. And you think Mike Trout's going to still be around and you're going to have to pay him all that money. That's that's my theory. And Tatis, you could argue, okay, he's getting paid a lot too. And that's why I'm not picking Tatis either. Acuna, Ronald Acuna. He's getting paid like eight mil for the next four or five years, I believe. And he's a center fielder. One of you need somebody in center field that's gonna be able to track things down. I mean, Mike Trout, obviously, but I'm saying Acuna's. He's he's gonna be phenomenal, in my opinion. That's just who I'll pick. And then Logan. So do I get do I get to rebut? Do I get to defend okay. myself? Real yeah, quick? go ahead, go ahead, Aaron. So I considered I considered Tatis, Acuna, and Juan Soto. Juan Soto. But I I just think that. Trout's impact, because those are impact players, but Trout's impact is just on another level in terms of being a five-tool, put him in any batting order, and he's going to do an insane amount of damage. And I think uh, four or five years, I don't know, you could be good in like two or three. And I think even in his early 30s, uh, Mike Trout has had some injuries in his career, but he's never really had like a catastrophic injury. I think he's going to be very impactful well into his mid-30s. I'm not going to guarantee like late 30s, but... I think when Mike Trout is 35 years old, he's still going to be a well above average player. But I, uh, I take your points. I accept them. I don't agree, but I accept them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Logan, I'm not going to lie, man. When you said Trey Young first, <laughs> I had to hold it back. Dude is – okay. Um, here, How are we going to start? He's a one-way player. Uh, he has like – the worst defensive rating, he's like 80th in the league in terms of point guards, in terms of defensive rating. And, yeah, you could argue he's one of the best point guards offensively. But I need somebody that's going to hustle on defense for me, I think. But Luca, I like that pick. But I agree with Spencer. I think Giannis should have been in the conversation as well. But um, I guess in my opinion, I feel like I can build better on a point guard than I can more so Giannis's position. So I would have went Luca. But yeah, just that Trey one, Trey Young one is a little uh, wild to me. I would say, okay, I did not know about the defensive rating, so I can agree with that. <laughs> but I will also say, I am more of an, I like more old school basketball. So I like point guards who can shoot. So if I were to build my team, I, I would want the point guard shooting and the center and the power forward. If you leave the paint, paint you're cut. So. <laughs> I like just the, my primary ball handler to be Trey Young, a point guard, rather than where you look at the Pelicans and their primary ball handler is Zion Williamson, which I don't really agree with that. But and then and for Luca, I think we can agree he's top five, should be for MVP. Maybe not this season, but last season definitely pretty close. Okay, now. <laughs> I think Spencer's, it's uh, like NFL, it's hard to argue for anybody else, right? Like quarterback, you got to pick a QB. And Mahomes, he's young. He's got all the money. But here's the thing. When you throw all this money at a quarterback, it gets hard. It gets hard to build your team around it. The Chiefs got a short window here in a couple of years that they got to hit on. Otherwise, after that, I don't know. It's it's it's, it's It always goes that way, it seems like, with these quarterbacks that get paid a lot it's like they have that uh you know your rookies or whatever then all of a sudden when you guys start paying all your rookies and you got to pay this quarterback you got to start to let all those other guys around him go so that's why I feel like I would have went with like a or I would still went with Mahomes I'm just saying I would have kind of thought about maybe like a Joe Burrow I know he just got injured but that's just nothing to throw out or um even like a Josh Allen uh he's very interesting but I think I agree. Mahomes definitely an uh, obvious pick there. But as much as we had fun with talking about the good side of things, now we got to get into, you know, maybe some, some more controversial territory. Do you guys think the draft lottery in the NBA is a good thing or not? Personally, I think yes. Um, so I'm of the opinion that tanking shouldn't be fined or punished. 
might not be great to watch, but uh, there are certain teams in certain markets that literally the only way they can be successful and compete with the bigger market teams is to tank and hit on draft picks. That's just the reality of the situation. Um, and I think it makes the process more random and it doesn't ensure that the tanking will be 100% successful. And even a lot of those teams that end up with the top draft picks like the Cavaliers and the Timberwolves uh, hasn't really done much for them. So I think uh, the draft lottery is a good thing. And uh, I don't really understand the argument that it isn't, honestly, just because, like, I mean, the NFL is fine, you know, whatever record you get, you get that pick, but it adds an element of surprise and kind of keeps the drama going. Uh, deeper into the offseason, which is a, another aspect that I think helps out the NBA. But yeah, overall, draft lottery, good. If you were to ask me a couple of years ago, I would say the NBA should have had something else to decide uh, who gets the number one pick. I've heard ideas thrown around uh, like, so it's uh, eight teams from each conference. So then the remaining teams from each conference they play each other in a single game elimination tournament and the winner gets a number one draft pick. That's how, that's what I thought would work because a couple of years ago, I think we can agree tanking was a problem. It, it almost seemed like there was three teams in each conference that were tanking. And now it seems like the NBA is really competitive. Uh, I think there's maybe now one or two teams from each conference that you could argue seems like they're tanking that being, let's say maybe the Pistons, and I don't even know. I mean, the the West is very competitive. But And then on the NFL side, I think the only real cases we've seen of tanking that is like, okay, that's, that's not – I mean, they, can, they obviously know they can win. Was the Philadelphia Eagles this year in that one game where they replaced Jalen Hurts for someone else, I, their third string? I can't even remember his name. But I think that with the NFL, there's no real way that you can uh, do a different draft lottery. But uh, overall, now it is good. I can agree with both sides that with both sports, draft lottery is A-OK. -okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, eliminates teams from fully tanking um, or as much as um, fully possible. Um, kind of keeps those bottom feeders a little bit more competitive. Um, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, I think, I, I think we're going to be – all in agreement here, unfortunately, because I would have liked to have some more controversy. But the only thing I would say that they could change about it is, like, I don't like how the fifth and sixth, um, like, worst teams have a, such a high chance of getting the number one pick. Like, they could be 9% and then all of a sudden just be number one. And it's like, this team was legit, like, okay and decent, and now they have, like, the number two pick. It just – I don't like that part of it. I think they should, you know, have, like, a threshold or something where – if you're below this, you at least have guaranteed odds at, you know, a top five or top three pick. But um, I definitely think, especially in a sport like basketball, I mean, it's different than uh, football and baseball, too. Like, one player has so much more control on the game. And especially with, like, a number one pick where you could have the chance at a Zion, uh, LeBron, just, like, those type of um, generational type players. Like, it's, uh, it's definitely something to take a little more serious, is guess what I'm trying to get at. But we mentioned a little bit, you know, those number one picks, they're not guarantees all the time. And who do you guys think are some of those worst draft picks in history, those draft busts somewhat, some might say? So for the NFL, I think it's obviously Ryan Leaf and Jamarcus Russell. Um, Ryan Leaf was drafted second overall, and it – it looks really bad in comparison to Peyton Manning having the career he did, being drafted first overall. But since he was the number two pick and Jamarcus Russell was the number one pick, I'm going to pick on Jamarcus Russell a little bit more. By the way, uh, once upon a time, a seven-year-old boy named Aaron Hickman had a career with Jamarcus Russell on uh, Madden 07 with Vince Young on the cover, another quarterback who ended up being a bust. And uh, he had a Hall of Fame career in that game, but that wasn't the case in real life. So uh, if you look at the other draft picks in that 2007 draft, there was Calvin Johnson, Joe Thomas, Adrian Peterson, Patrick Willis, Marshawn Lynch, Darrell Revis, Greg Olson. The list goes on and on and on of impact players. 
I'd say three or four players, maybe even five players that are guaranteed Hall of Famers in that draft class. And then you have DeMar- Jamarcus Russell, who just sticks out like a sore thumb. Uh, ended up just being lazy, out of shape, and out of the league in a couple years. For the NBA, uh, I'm going to be fair to Sam Bowie because he averaged 11 points and almost eight rebounds for his career, which is maybe not what you expect from a number one pick. But unfortunately, Michael Jordan was drafted after him, and no one really expected Jordan to have the kind of career that he did. So I'm not going to pick on Sam Bowie for that. But uh, I think it's got to be Darko Milicic or Greg Oden. Darko Milicic drafted second overall, averaged six points and four rebounds, uh, completed the tradition of playing for the Timberwolves before you're out of the league, like every bus does. And uh, Dwayne Wade, Mello, and Chris Bosh were all drafted after him. And then Greg Oden drafted first overall, had a bunch of injuries, averaged eight points and six rebounds, and the very next pick after him is arguably the greatest scorer in NBA history in Kevin Durant. And then Al Horford, Joakim Noah, and Marcus Saul were also in those in that draft. So uh, those are three or four of my biggest busts in history. And, uh, yeah. First of all, with Darko, he is an NBA champion. That's very uh, good to note. But anyways, I, I agree with you on Jamarcus Russell. Uh, I think you should have told the story about how the organization gave him film to watch and uh comes back the next day uh says he did watch it and uh that was a blank tape so i think that's one of the funniest stories to ever hear about jamarcus russell (laughs) also that i believe it was either training camp or an actual season he comes in and as a quarterback he was close to 300 pounds so if you look at pictures of him it's very funny to see that his archetype was an NBA quarterback, but I'll get to my picks. So I did have Jamarcus Russell, so I was very sad that you had already said his name, but, you know, obviously he's a big guy to say. Uh, but Johnny Football, Johnny Manziel, one of the best, you could say up there for the best college quarterback. One of, okay, you know what, one of the best. Uh, if you look at his stats, he had amazing rushing yards and touchdowns, uh, but that's really all he did was just run around in college And I'm not going to say that uh, it was only the off-field antics that got him out of the league so quickly, but uh, he he was a terrible player in the NFL. I think he won a game, maybe two. Uh, But if you do look, he did finish with seven touchdowns and seven interceptions. But moving on to the NBA, I think uh, that it is fair to say that Lonzo Ball could be considered a bust. I think that he is a poor shooter. And that uh, he is about to be, he's about to be on his third team, and what'll be his what? It'll be his fifth year coming up soon. There's talks about him getting traded. I think that if the Pelicans wanted to, they would either trade him or he won't be coming back after his contract expires. And then my other bust would have to be Adam Morrison, the uh, stinky player. Uh, Ended up actually winning a championship or two with the Lakers. But uh, both of those guys, not not great in the NBA at all. Uh, Lonzo Ball should have stayed in the NCAA for a season or two extra. All right, a few things. Um, disappointed you guys didn't mention um, Jermarcus Russell as uh, Mr. Job the Hut, fat slob. <laughs> Um, that, that, that was one of mine. Um, Johnny Football was going to be mine. Um, as you mentioned, um, I think, honestly, the funnest college football player I've ever watched, um, still in my life, um, only started eight NFL games. I was convinced to lead the Browns out of the dungeon. Um, just seven touchdowns in the games. Um, with that being said, NFL one actually ended up being a – he was an okay NFL player. Um, two seasons above a thousand yards rushing, zero Pro Bowls though. Um, with how exciting he was in college, I was expecting him to be one of the best running backs ever. Um, and that's Reggie Bush. Um, again, not not necessarily a huge plus, just because he did put together an NFL career where he played uh, double digit seasons and stuff. But I was expecting him to be one of the all time greats. Um, NBA. I'm disappointed nobody mentioned Kwame Brown. Um, six point six points per game. 
uh, certified bum. Uh, and that's my easy pick there. Michael Jordan made him cry. <laughs> <laughs> I typically uh, go away from guys like Odin, um, just because I tend to give guys the benefit of the doubt if they were bust um, due to injuries. Um, Kwame was the bust because he stunk, not because of injuries. <clears throat> All right, guys. Get, sh- get your internet browsers open. I got one for you, okay? Let's rewind the tapes to 1999 NFL Draft. You, you guys, any idea who you think draft bus in there? Well, we're going to head to the defensive side of the ball. Defensive end for my Minnesota Vikings, Demetrius Underwood. Drafted in the first round with our 29th pick. We actually traded up to get him. And uh, guess what? He was cut by the team before we even played a preseason game. We drafted him the first round. Mans didn't even play a preseason game. This was the most lunatic player I think I've ever heard about. And when I found out a story a couple years ago, I've just like, it's engraved my brain because it's so like unique. Um, So after... They drafted him. He was like, nah, I don't want to play. It wasn't like a contract or anything like that. He's just like, nah, man, God tells me I don't want to play football anymore. So the Vikings are like, okay, like we'll just take the money back. So they take the money back from him, and he only got, like I think, a couple hundred thousand for like the signing bonus. Then he's like, ah, just kidding. I'm going to go sign with the Dolphins. So he goes to the Dolphins, and then, um, you know, he played for them for like a couple preseason games, and they're like, there were stories of him in team meetings. He was not, like, taking notes or anything. He was just writing about the apocalypse and doing some funny drawings and stuff. And then one time, he just, like, sprinted in the middle of the street and uh, was just screaming, like, help me, help me, or something. And then he, like, tried slicing his own neck. And then the Dolphins were like, okay, we're done. And the Cowboys signed him, and he was, like, mediocre because he started getting fat. But it was just, like, funny and that's always one I bring up because, like, he was a first-round pick and legit didn't even play a preseason game. But, uh, so, yeah, I look up Demetrius Underwood for some crazy stories. But um, you guys, yeah, I mean, Demarcus Russell is just a meme. He's hilarious. But, and I'm kind of with Spencer that Greg Oden isn't the NBA one, but how do you guys not mention Anthony Bennett? Anthony Bennett, man, goes number one. The only thing with that, with Anthony Bennett, is, like, that draft class is kind of garb garbage but i mean there was still old depot um and some like serviceable players instead of anthony bennett that uh was like out of the league in four years so um yeah just a interesting pick by the cat and he wasn't even supposed to be like a lottery pick and then all of a sudden it's like Cavs so like anthony bennett number one it's like huh who it's just weird yeah, I I didn't pick him just because of the weakness of that draft class. And I know there was Oladipo, I think McCollum, and Giannis too, but no one expected Giannis to yeah. be this insane. He was a skinny little kid from Greece. But uh, yeah, Anthony Bennett, definitely a huge bust. Also completed the, the uh, rite of passage by playing for the Timberwolves before being out of the league. But uh, yeah, I just I gave him the benefit of the doubt just because of the weakness of that draft class overall. Yeah. I, I agree. Same here. Um, and I also didn't consider him because in the moment, I thought it was a horrible pick. And in the moment, I like I just thought it would – I knew it was going to be a bad moment. I felt bad for him. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't, like, any surprise that he wasn't going to be bad. Yeah, I got you. Surprised – or not surprised. I'm glad no one said Marco Fultz. I think he's definitely had a tough hand. He's injured. But I think he's going to be a great player for the Magic. In the future, um, wait. So Lonzo Ball, I want to get back to that. He's shooting like forty percent this year from three. He is. Expect on it, yeah. Fix that J in the off season. Inflated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, rigged. <laughs> Mark Kell's gonna get some shooting lessons from Lonzo. Let me tell you. <laughs> I just, but I will say LaMelo is going to be the more successful brother in the NBA. Oh, hands down. He already hands is, down. honestly. <laughs> uh, give Angelo a chance. Okay, he's young. Oh, he was on the Thunders G League team, and I was hoping they would bring him up last season, but they never did. And then he was on the – was he G League Pistons this year, or was he actually on the Pistons roster? Okay. Yeah. 
his dad just isn't fighting for him anymore. He's got Lamelo and Lonzo. Leangelo's the forgotten one. Never lost. Never lost. Yo, Aaron, we talking about Timberwolves, bro? Johnny Flynn, man, he was solid. <laughs> <laughs> but just, we're just going to talk about just terrible draft decisions just overall. Take, Johnny draft. Flynn. Johnny Flynn and Ricky Rubio in the <laughs> same draft. With back Steph to back. Curry in that draft. Was it back to back? The, this is why no, the Timberwolves. Like I saw something like four and six or something. Tim Tim Duncan Duncan in his career had more wins than the Timberwolves have in the existence of their franchise. Like the Timberwolves are the worst <laughs> franchise in North American sports. It's actually insane. And like Kevin Garnett was trying to buy the team. But their terrible owner, Glenn Taylor, like they have bad blood and just wouldn't let him. And until Glenn Taylor is no longer the owner, honestly, he's gonna have to just die one of these days. The Timberwolves are gonna continue <laughs> their their terrible run of just being an embarrassment. Uh, you would you're saying the worst sports team in North American sports? Yes, Timberwolves, hand down, hands down. The way they run. Every- Everything. It's the way they do everything. Cleveland that's Browns. that's true. I mean, okay, the Cleveland Browns, but at least they've made the playoffs. And so have the Timberwolves, but they have not gone far. Like, last time they made it was, I remember, it was with Derrick Rose against a series against the Rockets, and they lost in five. With and Jimmy Butler. Yeah, and Jimmy Butler. Yeah, and mm-hmm. Jimmy Butler took them to the playoffs for the first time in, like, 14 years, I think. 2004 was the last time they made it. Blew it with KG, best player in franchise history. Blew it, goes to the Celtics, almost immediately wins a ring. And then now they have Carl Anthony Towns. Uh, they have D'Angelo Russell. Carl Anthony Towns and D'Angelo Russell, I think, haven't even played a game together yet. Soon, Carl Anthony Towns is going to be sick of it and leave. Jimmy Butler already got sick of it and leave. D'Angelo Russell is going to get sick of it and leave. Andrew Wiggins is gone, and he's better on the Warriors than he was on the Terminals. They never have a good head coach. They just fired their head coach midseason and immediately hired a new head coach from another team midseason instead of promoting an assistant. Just the way they do everything just irks me on some – I don't even know. It just irks me on a certain level that I just feel like – I just feel bad for every player that plays for them, honestly. Do you like Anthony Edwards? I like him. I think he needs to be way more efficient. I think – his ceiling is going to be like a, a high energy guy that, you know, gets the dunks and isn't much of a shooter. Uh, I think LaMelo Ball is going to have a better career than him. I think Wiseman probably will too. I think I wouldn't be spi- surprised if Tyrese Halliburton has a better career than Anthony Edwards. But yeah, and who knows what it can be like on another team. I mean, it's just the Timberwolves. Even when they try to compete, like they're trying to compete with Towns and Russell, and they're the worst team in the NBA this year. So they should have played usual. They should have taken Lamelo. Yeah, they really should have, honestly. Yo, Aaron, you so want to talk about Timberwolves, the Jets, man? Timberwolves rant. Yo, Aaron, yeah, you want to talk about the Jets instead of the Timberwolves? Things what's, are looking up. Things are what's looking. What's the up. quarterback situation? What do you What do you exactly. think they're gonna do? So if they well, don't trade for Deshaun Watson, which, which they is like my dream, it's unlikely. It is unlikely. I'll give you that. If that doesn't happen. It's looking like Zach Wilson at number two. Maybe Justin Fields if he look, looks a little bit better with, like, workouts and things like that. Or if the Jaguars are dumb and they don't draft Trevor Lawrence, that then that would be great. But I think things are looking up. Second most cap space in the NFL. In the next couple weeks, they should, they should – they have no excuse not to improve a lot with the amount of money that they have. Robert Sala, the exact opposite of Adam Gase, high-energy guy who players love. Everyone on the 49ers raves about him. I wouldn't be surprised if the Jets sign a guy like Richard Sherman to come help uh, put his defense in place. And, yeah, honestly, I I have more hope as a Jets fan right now than I have since probably year one of Rex Ryan. Hunter Henry to the Jets. Very – that could help. Do you uh, – he gets, he gets hurt, but maybe. Aaron, would you be mad if um, they drafted Jamar Chase second and kept Sam Darnold at QB? Um, I wouldn't be mad just because – I will never be mad at Sam Darnold in my life just because of how terrible the franchise has been to him, setting him up. Like, I, 
if he got another chance with hopefully a better team around him, I wouldn't mind seeing that. And I want to see how he does in a Shanahan style offense because that's what the Jets are going to have now. But I just think it's better to move on for both sides. Uh, uh, I think a team like the Chargers or the Steelers would be really good. Or not the Chargers, the Colts. I was, I was thinking Rivers and I said Chargers. But uh, the Colts or the Steelers would be good for Darnold. Um, I just know I'm rooting for him wherever he goes. If that happens to be the Jets, cool. But it's just, I feel like it's reached its natural point of just moving on for both sides. So if they draft uh, a quarterback, do you think they'll, they'll cut Darnold or they'll trade him, trade him away? They're, they'll trade him. He, they can get a second, probably a second round pick, maybe even a late first, depending on the team. But they could definitely get a second or third out of him. So it'd be it'd be smart to trade him. What's Gardner Minshew going to do?